Hello, I'm Paul Larson. Children all over the globe know illustrator Stephen Kellogg's characters on the printed page, but the artist really brings them to life during his personal appearances. In this author visit, we'll see Kellogg entertaining a young audience in northern New York State where he lives. He recently had an art exhibition at a family health care center where he invited a group of children into his whimsical world. So Jenny decided not to serve the meat and potatoes and vegetables that she had cooked for the main part of the meal. Jenny decided she would cheer things up by wheeling in the dessert right away. Hot marshmallow cheesecake with raspberry fudge sauce, she announced. And through the door came Jenny wheeling this spectacular dessert. Author and illustrator Stephen Kellogg has made a career out of entertaining and encouraging kids. I think encouraging and supporting children is about one of the most important responsibilities we have as, uh, as, as members of a society which will be inherited by our children. During a personal appearance at Smith House Family Health Care, he prescribes a steady diet of books. When I was a little boy, I used to love to make up stories and draw the pictures to go with my stories. I did that all the time for my two younger sisters. I also used to love to go to the library and check out books and bring those books home to read to myself. I used to look at all the beautiful and interesting pictures. And before I learned to read, I would corner the grown-ups in my house and say, please read this book to me. Kellogg relates to kids with tales of his own youth and I realized I love to write stories, I love to draw pictures, I love books, and I love kids. So I thought, why not put all that together and be an author and an illustrator of books for kids? And that's exactly what I have been doing for the last 40 years since I've been a grown-up. Many of Kellogg's ideas for books come from his own experience. My mom and dad didn't agree with me. They didn't want a pet very badly at all. My mom said, animals belong in the forest or in the jungle, maybe in the zoo, but definitely not in the home. Well, when I grew up, I remember that feeling of wanting something alive that I could love and hug and feed and take very good care of, something of my very own. And I put that feeling into a story, into a book I called, Can I Keep Him? So through this story and through these illustrations, I can share that long ago feeling with boys and girls all over the country and with kids all over the world. Because here's Can I Keep Him in French for boys and girls in France to read. And here's Can I Keep Him in Japanese for kids in Japan to read. And if you look very closely at this book, I bet you can see even from the back row, this book's printed in an entirely different alphabet. A series of popular pet stories began from a day when Kellogg and his wife were looking at puppies. And we said, let's take one of those puppies home and turn him into a pet, and we'll call him Pinkerton. Well, we brought little Pinkerton home, and he hit our family like an artillery shell, like a bomb. Pinkerton was crazy, he was stubborn, he was perverse. Pinkerton did everything backwards. In no time flat, he became enormous. He turned our family into total chaos and the house into a complete mess. Pinkerton was such, such an engaging character. He was so full of humor and, and he was so loving and, so, and, and such a great companion that somehow the spirit of that kind of evolved into each one of the Pinkerton books. The first book was inspired by the dog's period of adjustment with the Kelloggs. I will call his book Pinkerton Behave! <laughs> the artist has illustrated about 120 books including 40 he wrote himself. I think for children there's, there's something transporting about stories, as there is for adults as well. Our stories, I think, are just a part of our subconscious. We, uh, we use stories to move outside and explore distant horizons, and it also helps us to go to explore and understand our interior emotional horizons as well. Jack and the Beanstalk was one of my favorite fairy tales when I was a child, and I retold and illustrated it in the mid-'80s. This particular illustration came at the point in the story when Jack and his mother have become estranged from each other because he has... Uh, uh, been given the responsibility of selling the family cow, and he instead he traded it for six magical beans. His mother, in a rage, threw the beans into the garden and then uh, sent Jack to bed without any supper. And here we see him uh, uh, sadly falling asleep while his mother weeps on the porch in, in misery and despair, uh, thinking that uh, she's now doomed to poverty and, and, uh, and, and wretchedness for the rest of her life. And, but meanwhile, the major theme of the illustration is, is that the beans have germinated in the garden, and with enormous power, the, the beans. This talk is starting to surge skyward into the, uh, into the night. 
The illustrated book is really a duet between words and images. The verbal and the visual come together, each telling part of the story, and as they blend and become one, the viewer through the eye and the ear is totally uh, lost in the world that's created by those, by those two voices and the entire uh, world that those two voices create. His Tall Tale series makes giants like Paul Bunyan an easy read for smaller people. The books include the fictional adventures of a real-life pioneer who planted seeds in the Midwest. This illustration is from my retelling of the book Johnny Appleseed, which was published in the, uh, in the mid-80s, and uh, it's, it's placed uh, towards the end of the book when Johnny Appleseed has been established as a legendary character in his own lifetime. One of the th fun things about the picture for me is the contrast of uh, a vulnerable little Johnny Appleseed who doesn't particularly strike a, a heroic figure, and, and uh, we see him in, in, in all these threatening situations where the adversarial threat seems completely uh, overpowering, and that there's no hope for Johnny, but he does come out uh, unscathed every time. Kellogg says he enjoys the physicality of books and the surprises that appear at the turn of a page. For his young audience members, he'll even draw their attention to how books are put together. We're opening the book up, and we see the end paper. The end paper is the first page of the opening matter. Every book has three to five pages of what's called opening matter. The end paper, the copyright and dedication page, the title page, and I try to illustrate those pages with pictures that give you some clues about the story, get, help you to get to know the characters a little bit better. It, the whole thing is to en encourage their visual literacy and, and, to, and, and to make them appreciate all the nuances and, and recognize the, the, the various uh, structural details that uh, are involved in putting a book together. When facing an audience, Kellogg doesn't only read his books, he also recreates them. But then as the days passed, the weather grew colder and colder and colder, and the wind began to blow, and the wind began to howl, the wind began to scream, and it lashed the ocean into great, dark, foaming waves that tossed that little ship wildly about. Those little mice were unprepared for winter weather. They thought they'd been sailing towards a tropical island. They ran below decks. They huddled close to the waffle iron, the only source of heat, all except for poor Captain Bouncer, because Bouncer had volunteered the job of captain. He had to stay at the helm, and here he is with icicles on his whiskers, and his paws and his toes are freezing as he tries to guide that ship through the howling winds and thundering waves and freezing rains. Having a, a, an ongoing contact with the audience and, and, and getting their reaction to stories, I find it a very satisfying experience. It's, it's, it's part of the creativity, it's part of the life of the book, is, is having a personal relationship with the audience. It was really cool how he drew the, all those pictures. I didn't know how he drew it so well. It was really cool. The author invites kids to try their own hand at creating books. Each of you has stories inside of yourselves that no one's ever told before and no one can ever tell again. Those stories are a very important part of who you are. And if you wrote your stories down, you'd be an author. If you made pictures to go with your stories, you'd be an illustrator. What I enjoy about writing books is probably the way you can ex express yourself. We get to know our t our ourselves by, by sharing our stories and we also use the stories as a way of, of, of reaching out to other people and since communication is about the most important skill we, we have and we need to refine our communication skills as we're growing up and one of the ways to do that is through, uh, is through developing our confidence and, and our imaginations as storytellers and an involvement with the arts and appreciation with the arts and an understanding of the arts and, and the confidence in their own ability to participate in the arts is, 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 uh, is a legacy that every child should have access to. Author Visits is a production of Mountain Lake PBS. To learn more about the authors and their books, head to our website at mountainlake.org.